So I've got to press F8 on this Asus motherboard to get into the BIOS or F2 or delete, uh, depending on what motherboard you've got, what manufacturer it might be, F12, it might be delete, it might be F2, it could be anything really, it might be F9. Um, you'd have to find that out as to what button you have to press when the machine's booting. So F8 gives me a boot menu, but it also gives me the option to enter the setup, which is why I tend to use it rather than delete or F2. So this will take me into the BIOS configuration. And what I need to do on this machine is go into the boot, secure boot, and turn off this Windows UEFI mode. If you can see down the bottom, it says execute the Microsoft secure boot check. Only select this option when booting Windows UEFI mode or other Microsoft Secure Boot compliant operating systems. So because we're going into Linux, I've got to turn this to other OS where it says select this option to get optimized functions when booting on Windows non UEFI mode and Microsoft Secure Boot on non compliant operating systems. So um, I'm not sure if Gen 2 has the right security key to load in. Uh, it doesn't matter if it does or not because I'm just going to leave that on other OS. There are one or two distributions that I believe do, but I've never used them um, installing the uh, security keys on the BIOS. Uh, again, if anybody wiser than me knows if Gen 2 has got these keys, I'd be interested to know. So if that's all I need to do there. I'll save those settings. And then this time when it boots, I'll go into the boot menu and I'll have to select that USB stick to boot from because otherwise it will probably boot from uh, Windows. The alternative, um, certainly with this BIOS, if I go back into the setup, there's an option here to boot directly to the um, operating system. So here if I go down to this boot override and select the UEFI USB partition 2 and press enter. That way you can see that I've booted into the USB and not Windows. When um, you do boot, you get this menu coming up and there's three options here. One to boot Gen 2, one to boot the Live CD Gen 2 but a cached version and one to do Memtest 86 plus 64 bit UEFI. Um, if you've never done compiling before on your machine, it's probably a good idea to run Memtest to test the memory um, and let it run through. It may take several hours to run a pass. It might take, depending on how much memory you've got, it might take something like 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Um, it's advisable to let it run for a few passes, maybe three passes. Uh, as I say, depending on how much memory, it might take a lot longer. So it might be something you want to do overnight. But you just let it run through. And when it's done first pass, it comes up somewhere on this machine, on this screen, um, saying pass or pass number one um, in green, I think, as I remember. Um, just to give you some, a basic uh, level of confidence in the fact that your memory is good and that your CPU is likely uh, in a good condition, sufficient cooling to do a bit of heavy duty compiling. Uh, once you're happy that's been done, you can press escape and the machine reboots. So we'll have to press F8 again or whatever key your BIOS uses to get the options to um, boot into the different operating system, which is the USB again. So this time I won't go into setup. I'll just select the option to boot the USB stick here. Get the same menu up. Now, if you're limited on memory, and I'd say probably generally two gigabytes per core is what you're looking at. So if you, for example, you have four cores with eight gigabytes, that's probably about the maximum that any compiling would use. So if you did have eight gigabytes with four cores, you probably want to select the first option because you haven't really got that much wiggle room in terms of RAM when, when you come to do some of the bigger packages, compiling with bigger packages. If you had 16 gigabytes for four cores, well, that's plenty uh, because at two, two times four, that's eight gigabyte. You've got eight gigabyte free. So in that case, select cached. And what it'll do, it'll read most, if not all of the um, CD image into memory and run it from there. It just means that when you're using 
the live environment, you're less likely to have some uh, unexpected pauses every now and then while it's reading the USB. It's just a bit more convenient. Um, with with the default option, you, you'll have to expect that sometimes um, the PC may not be responding for a few seconds while it's accessing the USB. Um, even a fast USB, you'll, you'll notice there may be some slight pauses. So it's beneficial to use cache, but as I say, only if you are confident you've got enough memory. So I'll just wait for this to boot. Um, because it's cached, it'll take a little bit longer at the beginning, as opposed to if it wasn't cached. Um, if it wasn't cached, it would just be booting now because it hasn't got to read everything in, but it's reading everything in off the USB at the moment, so there will be a bit more of a pause. But as I say, once we're in there, we shouldn't really notice any, any hindrance at all. Okay, so it's read that image in, so it should be booting directly out of memory now. And if you have any problems getting a graphical screen up, um, any other boot problems, keyboard not working, mouse not working, uh, there is some help on the Gen 2 web page as to some of the options you can set um, when you're booting to either disable things or enable certain things to um, allow your hardware to work correctly. So when it boots, we get this welcome screen up, which you can look at or just close down. Next thing is quite important to do is to set up your keyboard. You don't want to be typing in certain symbols and getting different symbols because the default is a US keyboard and you're not in the US. So I'm in the UK. I need to set the keyboard up. For example, if I show you in the test there, if I press the hash key on the keyboard, I'll get as backslash. If I press the double quote button, I'll get an at symbol. The pound, I'll get a hash symbol. Uh, dollar, percent and so on, they work all right. The squiggle, I get a bar. Where the bar is, I get a greater than symbol. It's all, all completely wrong. So the first thing I do for a UK keyboard is set it to 105 key on this screen. I then change the layout. Go to configure layouts. I delete the US keyboard layout and click add. Search for UK and I add the UK extended windows keyboard and click OK. There is a preview somewhere. I think I might have just shut that down. Uh, yeah, it's here. The I'm sure there used to be a key, uh, a preview button here, but it looks like it's gone. If I put UK in again, select the Windows Extended, which I've already looked at. Press preview. It shows you the layout, and it more or less mirrors what my keyboard layout is uh, including the fact that it's an upside down L return button which is quite important for the actual position of some of the key keys on the keyboard so that's okay I'll press apply to make that active if I go back to hardware now and test the keyboard again so I've pressed the hash I'm getting the hash the squiggle the tilde get that Apostrophe, at sign, yep, it's all working now. Double quotes, uh, pound sign, I'm getting a pound sign, so it's all good. Um, another thing I'll do to set up here is under power management. Uh, some versions of the live GUI image had the suspend session set. Uh, looks like they've turned that off by default now. That could be a bit of a pain because if you're compiling, it puts the machine to sleep. Uh, and I'll, obviously it then stops the machine compiling but also sometimes it asks you for the password to get back in if it's locked the session so that could be a bit of a problem if you didn't know the password I'm going to turn the screen energy saving off because the screen will go blank when I'm recording and that won't be too helpful so it's optional whether you want to do that or not so that should be it for the configuration Next thing I'm going to do is to get the console up, which they've provided here for us, and a browser, which I've also provided a shortcut. So I'm going to move the console over here, 
and the browser over here and just try and split screen these two uh, let's push that over there so what you want to do i'm just using control and the wheel on the mouse to increase the font size so it's legible um, if you could see when i was scrolling it shows you the size it's 88 characters across by 45 down you don't want to set this for anything less than 80 characters across because um, for example the linux kernel when that um, is modified using menu config it won't run in a console that's got fewer than 80 characters so it's important to make sure you don't go any lower than that um, the next thing i want to do is to become root so i use sudo su minus to become root and i'm going to set the password for root because it's unknown just in case i need to know it or need to log in as root for any reason so it's just on this live cd so it won't retain it anywhere it's just while i've got this uh, live environment active and i'm also going to set the gen 2 password which is the user default user just so i know what it is in case again for example if it was a lock screen that comes up and it asks for the password i know what i've set it to uh, just just a convenient thing uh, save me getting myself locked out um, yeah now I said about the copying the image if you're already in a Linux I'll just quickly go through the command for that it's DD as I said before and you want to do in file equals and then the path to the image that you want to write so for example root uh, live GUI dot ISO for example out file equals the device you've got your uh, flash USB set in uh, set up as so if I do F disk minus L you can see my 15 gigabyte USB the sand disk is set to dev SDA so if I recall that command type in dev SDA then set block size to something like 64k so that it writes reasonably fast and you can do status equals progress to get some feedback on how how far it's progressed during the write so you, otherwise you're just sitting a, st uh, a blank screen not knowing whether it's actually writing or how far it's gone um, and that should be sufficient to write the image in another Linux and then you just boot as we did before Okay, so let's get on with building the new Gen 2 system. So what we've got to do is to click on Get Started, I believe. Yep. So get started with Gen 2, get a live boot environment. Well, we've done that. And then follow the installation instructions. It's as simple as that, two steps. Well, no, it's a little bit more involved. We need to click on here to get to the Gen 2 handbook. And the Gen 2 handbook is the instructions for installing gen 2 so it's not like ubuntu or debian where you get a few screens asking you what country you're in and what keyboard you've got and so on obviously it is a little bit more involved than that we've got lots of options and lots of choices to make uh, throughout the installation progress uh, progress um, and these options extend from um, how we want to lay out gen 2 to uh, things are a bit more important and perhaps less flexible such as what locale you're in um, to uh, what packages you want to install uh, what functionality you want and so on so there's various things uh, that you need to think about and uh, make decisions on so as you can see from the top the gen 2 distribution can be installed on various different architectures, complete different architectures. Uh, the ones that are probably going to be most Im important to people, well, primarily this one here, AMD 64, which is 64-bit Intel architecture. 
There's also 32-bit. Maybe some people will be using that. And then there's all these other, perhaps more esoteric uh, architectures, either older or um, less well-known, shall I say. Uh, I believe also you can install Gen 2 on ARM architecture. But as you can see, it's not officially supported at the moment. I think there is some support for it, but it's not officially supported. Uh, there is some information about it. So it says here about uh, the fact that it's available for many architectures. And yeah, the most two most prominent ones are the x86, which is Intel 32-bit, and x86-64, which is the AMD 64 or Intel 64-bit, if you like. Um, and... Yeah, it says important to choose the correct architecture. Well, I say most people are going to be going for the 64-bit AMD 64. Um, the main link for each handbook provides a section-by-section -section view for each of the four chapters. The handbook recommends this section-by-section -section view when installing Gen 2. But there's also a single-page projector view provided for readers who wish to view a single chapter at a time. So it says the ARM and ARM 64 architectures, oh, they are supported by Gen 2, but do not yet have handbooks at their disposal due to many various variations of the silicon on chips. So it's simply not practical for the handbook project to maintain a cohesive set of installation instructions. Um, please refer to the ARM or ARM64 project page, pages and bug for more information. Okay. So I, th I thought to myself when I was saying they're not supported, I'm sure I've done this on a Raspberry Pi. I've put Gen 2 on a Raspberry Pi. So maybe that's something else I could do in the future, update this. Because I have done Gen 2 videos uh, on an Intel machine before but it's uh, probably quite old now and I know that Gen 2 has changed a little bit over the last few years uh, so maybe I could redo the ARM64 one as well. Uh, yeah a good rule of thumb for new Gen 2 users if the CPU is manufactured after 2015 and the manufacturer is either Intel or AMD choosing the AMD handbook 64 handbook is probably the correct route well yes I, I tend to agree with that. So AMD 64 is 64-bit architecture that's compatible with the x86 architecture and thus also known as x86-64. It was first used by AMD under the AMD 64 name and Intel under the EM64T name and is now the most prominent architecture for medium and high-end desktop PCs. It's also commonly found in the server segment. Variants include AMD Athlon 64, Optron, Sampron, Phenom, FX Ryzen, Threadripper and Epic along with the Intel Pentium 4. Core 2, i3, i5, i7, i9, Xeon and some Atoms. So to get to the single page per chapter, which is also printable, that these are the four links. Uh, but I'm going to go up to the top. Oh, let's have a look, quick look at the frequently asked questions. Okay, it's just some general questions about the handbook so what we're going to do is go to the AMD 64 and this will take us to the uh, individual parts uh, for the handbook so these are the four chapters if you like and you can see they're broken down even further and here's the individual bits here for the first chapter the second chapter third and fourth and a quick description so Let's go straight into the first part of installing Gen 2. And if I just go back to this, this is all we really need, the first part, the first chapter to install Gen 2. After that, it's just more information about running Gen 2 and using it. Um, just getting to know portage and uh, how things work within Gen 2. But certainly as far as the installation is concerned, the first chapter is all we really need. So welcome to Gen 2. It's a free operating system based on Linux that can automatically can be automatically optimized and customized with just about any application or need. It's built on the Leica system of free software and does not hide what is running beneath the hood from its users. So Gen 2's premier tools are built from simple programming language, Portage. Gen 2's package maintenance system is written in Python. 
eBuilds, which provide package definitions for Portage are written in Bash. Our users encourage to review, modify, and enhance the source code for all parts of Gen 2. Uh, by default, packages are only patched when necessary to fix bugs or provide inter interoperability with Gen 2. They are installed into the system by compiling source code provided by upstream projects in binary format, although support for pre-compiled binary packages is included too. Configuring Gen 2 happens through text files. For the above reasons and others, openness is built in as a design principle. Um, and as we'll come to see, this is uh, probably one of the arguments about using System D and System V or System 5. Um, with System 5, System V I tend to call it, uh, configuration is done through text files. With System D, the configuration tends to be done through commands. Um, so Gen 2 does allow System D, but I think I get the impression that System V is probably the one that is preferred uh, for the installation. So yeah, it mentions it here. Choice is another design principle. When installing Gen 2, choices made clear throughout the handbook. System administrators can choose two fully supported init systems. Yeah, Gen 2's own OpenRC and free desktop org system d so yeah they they do seem to prefer the open rc or system v in it um, it's probably better known as uh, partition structure for storage disks what file systems use on disks a target system profile remove right features and global or system wide or package specific level via use flags bootloader network management utility and much much more and as a development philosophy, Gen 2 authors try to avoid forcing users into a specific system profile or desktop environment. If something is offered in a Gen 2 Linux ecosystem, it's likely available in Gen 2. Uh, sorry, in the GNU Linux ecosystem, it's likely available in Gen 2. If not, we'd love to see it. So for new package requests, please file a bug report or create your own build repository. Being a source bait based operating system allows Gen 2 to be ported onto new computer instruction architectures and also allows all installed packages to be tuned. This strength surfaces into another Gen 2 design principle power. The system administrator who has successfully installed and customized Gen 2 has compiled a tailored operating system from source code. The entire operating system can be tuned at binary level via mechanisms including in portages make.com file if so desired adjustments can be made on a per package basis or package group basis in fact entire sets of functionality can be added or removed using use flags and for me as i've already mentioned this is the real power and uniqueness of gen 2. it's very important that the handbook reader understands that these design principles are what makes gen 2 unique with principles of great power many choices extreme openness highlighted diligence, thought and intentionality should be employed while using Gen 2. So you can't just sit on your hands and wait for it to be installed. As I said before, you do have to make decisions based on certain choices. Sometimes they have to be informed decisions. I hope to point that out as we go through um, anything that might not be quite obvious. Um, and the handbook also uh, helps point things out and there's no doubt going to be things that are new to me as I say the handbook's moved on Gento's moved on since I last installed it so here's 10 steps in installing Gento and it tells us what each each step hopes to achieve so we're at step one at the moment the user in the work environment ready to install Gento we've installed or we've booted the live GUI uh, version of Gento and we are ready to install the next thing we're going to have to do is to check the interconnect connection. We'll initialize the hard disk. We'll prepare the environment uh, that we've got to true into a new environment. True is a form of assigning part of the disk hierarchy to be what appears to be the new root environment. Um, some core packages are installed which are common to all Gen 2 installations. So they're basically critical parts of the Gen 2 core system. We install the kernel, tweak some configuration files, install some system tools, install the bootloader, 
and then we boot into the fresh Gen 2 and take it from there, start building our system properly, um, basically installing what applications and tools we want to install. Uh, and as it says here, whenever a certain choice is presented, the handbook will try to explain the pros and cons of each choice. Although the text then continues with a choice, a default choice, which is identified by default in the title, the other possibilities will be documented as well, marked by alternative in the title. Do not think that the default is what Gen2 recommends. It is, however, the choice that Gen2 believes most users will make. So not necessarily the recommended, but probably the most common option that people will take. Sometimes an optional step can be followed, such steps are marked as optional and therefore not needed to install Gen2. However, some optional steps are dependent on previously made decision. The instructions will inform the reader when this happens, both when the decision is made and right before the optional step is described. Gen2 can be installed in many different ways. It can be downloaded and installed from official Gen2 installation media, such as our bootable ISO images, which we, what we've done. The installation media can be installed on a USB stick or accessed via a net booted environment. Alternately, Gen2 can be installed from non-official media such as an only installed distribution or a non-Gen2 bootable disk such as Nopix. The document we're reading covers the installation using official Gen2 installation media or in certain cases net booting. So net booting is probably a little bit more involved, won't be mentioning that at all. Uh, there's a note here for help with other installation approaches, including using non Gen 2 bootable media. Please read our alternative installation guide. Uh, as I say, I highly recommend using the Gen 2 installation media, it does make things a little bit simpler. We also provide a Gen 2 installation tips and tricks document, that might be useful. Let's have a quick look at that. So that's about using RAID, probably to boot onto a RAID using 2.4 kernel, so that's quite out of date. CD kernel. Okay, so this is if you want to leave the terminal by using a multi screen multiplexer, sense of testing the disks. So yeah, if you've got a disk that you might want to form a read test on it's telling you to when you format the file system to add the minus c uh, option to test all the blocks uh, modern disks that's probably not needed uh, if you are using a disk that you think might have errors on i'd advise you to get another disk rather than risk putting an operating system on a disk that you suspect might be faulty Uh, some information there about how to recover from a malfunction installation. So there's a little bit of information there, but nothing particularly useful uh, in this situation. Uh, troubles. If a problem is found in the installation, please visit our bug tracking system. So hopefully we don't find anything. Um, although this document is architecture specific, it may contain references to other architectures as well because large parts of Gen 2 handbook use text that is identical for all architectures. Uh, so there's that to bear in mind. If there is some uncertainty about whether or not the problem is a user problem, um, there's a web chat channel on IRC Libera chat. And there's a frequently asked questions article and facts and of course the Gen 2 forums which um, I've used a few times they're very helpful on there um, so there's yeah lots of FAQs on there if you do get stuck it gives you some background behind Gen 2 so that looks like a good read uh, alright there's two links to the same place for the looks of it all oh, right, frequently asked questions section on the forums. So that could be useful. And then the top level uh, forums page will look at four different categories. So again, that could be useful. You can see it's um, updated regularly. July the 10th, they're uh, installing Gen 2. So some people obviously had problems 
uh, today. So choosing the right installation medium. So this is about uh, using, well, in fact, it's about doing what we've already done, but in a little bit more detail. Um, something we didn't do is verify the uh, download, which is a little bit harder to do in Windows. I believe you can check for uh, SHA-1 some, I think, files in the PowerShell. I'm not sure about SHA-256. Um, but yeah, normally would have checked that. Um, oh, it does mention something called GPG for Win can be used to check the cryptographic signatures. So I do give us some information there, a bit more detail. Uh, so yeah, that's stuff we've all done gives you some information there on how to write it to the USB and there's a, an example DD command if you're using Linux to write it uh, was there any information there about using Windows unfortunately not no oh here we go um, so that talks about burning the ISO to a disk, which, yeah, by default is easy to do with Windows now, um, but not how to write it to a USB stick, which is probably what most people would want to do. Uh, it gives some information about booting. So, yeah, you could read all this before you get to this point while you're in Windows to get an idea of what to do. Um, but hopefully what I've shown will be enough. Uh, and here's some of the options you can change if you do have problems booting the live GUI image and like I've already done it changes the root password here suggests to do that um, and in fact it creates a new user called John um, but I've just using existing Gen 2 user gives you an idea how to view the documentation online so if you're in a text browser uh, the, the minimal uh, uh, boot image to use a links text browser to view the web pages um, or to start the ssh daemon and do the installation remotely so there's various options about how to install it but as I say, i'm going to be installing it in this environment you can see here which is what you could have done uh, if you'd followed along uh, booting the live GUI uh, and just reading stuff on the left on the browser and typing commands in on the right. So let's move on and get the network running. So if you use DHCP, um, it says if not, it's not already running, DHCPD can be started. Internet connectivity can be tested. Let's go to this first of all, see if we have got internet connectivity. So it looks like it's taken us to a little bit further down the same page. Testing the network. Let's do IP route. And it says default via 192.168.01. The interface ID, which I'm going to make a note of because I might need that later. Uh, at the configuration point, so it's called ENP0S31F6. So I advise you, if you're following along, to take a note of that. And it's also repeated there as well with the looks of it. If no default route defined, internet connectivity is unavailable and additional configuration is required. So it looks like we have got connectivity. Let's try this ping command. And looks like that's working. So that's sufficient for me to know that the network is actually running. 
So I don't need to do anything here. If you do need to get anything running like DHCPD, DHCPCD, then obviously just follow these commands here. So yeah, here's that testing network we've just been on. And it says test the DNS resolution with that command. Um, I would say that looks like that's probably worked. Yeah, unless curl reports an error, an error or other test fails, the installation process can be continued with disk preparation. So basically, if you've got problems, there's lots more on this page to give you hints on how to get the networking up and running. Uh, there's wireless included there as well. Uh, there's a tool here for setting up the network, which helps with automatic configuration. Uh, and then manual network configuration. But as you can see, it's already working for me. So I'm just going to skip past all that. And if I can find that link to skip forward directly to the next part of this chapter, disk preparation. So let's take a good look at the disk oriented orientated aspects of Gen 2 Linux and Linux in general. Um, so we need to understand what block devices are, partitions, Linux file systems. Uh, once the ins and outs of disks are understood, partitions and file systems can be established for installation. To begin, let's look at block devices. SCSI and serial ATA devices are both labeled under device handles such as DevSDA, SDB, SDC. On more modern machines, PCI Express based NVMe solid state drives have device handles such as NVMe, 0N1, NVMe 0N2, etc. The following table will help readers determine where to find a certain type of block device on the system. So you can see there's either the IDE, SATA, SAS, SCSI or USB flash devices have the SD moniker, NVMe have the NVMe moniker and flash devices, uh, embedded flash devices have the MMC block moniker. So if we do fdisk minus L, we can see that on this machine, we've got one uh, PCI Express device and one SATA SCSI flash device. Well, I know f for a fact um, that this is the um, NVMe disk that's within the machine. Uh, and as you can see, it's got Microsoft partitions on it. And this device, the SDA, is the actual uh, flash device that I've booted from. So this is one I mustn't touch because that's the environment we're running at the moment. This is the one that I'll be dealing with, the NVMe 0N1. And the loop devices are just something to do with the way the uh, live GUI environment uh, is running, so we don't need to concern ourselves with that. But again, we mustn't touch that, uh, else the live environment will probably stop working. Uh, the block devices, oh, so it gives some more information here. So the uh, first lot, the SD type devices found on hardware from roughly 2000 until present. This device handle is perhaps most commonly used in Linux. Uh, these types of devices can be connected via the SATA bus, SCSI, USB bus and block store as block storage. Um, the latest solid state technology NVMe devices are connected to the PCI Express bus and have the fastest transfer block speeds on the market. Systems from around 2014 and new and may support NVMe hardware. Uh, even if you've got uh, an SSD, uh, you might have an SSD with a SATA interface, in which case it will still be referred to as an SDA uh, device but an SSD on the PCI Express interface will be referred to as NVMe. So it's more about the interface rather than the technology that's used. The block device above represents an abstract interface to the disk. User programs can use these block devices to interact with the disk without worrying about whether the drives are SATA, SCSI or something else. The program can simply address the storage of the disk as a bunch of contiguous, randomly accessible 4K blocks. 
So although it's theoretically possible to use the raw unpartitioned disk to house a Linux system, this is almost never done in practice. Instead, the block device is split up into smaller, more manageable block devices. So what they're saying is, for example, on this device here, the internal PCIe uh, storage, that's the block device. And within it, individual partitions have been configured by Windows in this case. On AMD64 systems, these are called partitions. There are currently two standard partition technologies in use, MBMR, uh, sorry, MBR, sometimes called DOS, Disk Label, and GPT. These are tied to the two brute process types, Legacy BIOS and UEFI. The GUID partition table, the GPT, also called GPT Disk Label, uses 64-bit identifiers for partitions. The location in which it stores the partition information is much bigger than 512 bytes, of the MBR partition table, the DOS disk label. So you could argue MBR is legacy. Uh, on a modern machine, you probably don't want to be using MBR. Um, if you're using UEFI, you almost certainly do not want to be using MBFR, uh, MBR, sorry. which means there is practically no limit on the number of partitions for a GPT disk. Also, the maximum partition size is much larger, almost eight zettabytes. So that's unimaginable how big that is. That's probably um, probably a terabyte times a terabyte, I imagine, that sort of uh, size. It's, uh, yeah, not something that will be in use for a number of years yet. When a system software interface between the operating system and firmware is UEFI instead of the BIOS, GPT is almost mandatory as compatibility issues will arise with a DOS disk label. GPT also takes advantage of checksumming and redundancy. It carries 30, CRC32 checksums to detect errors in the header and partition tables, and it has a backup GPT at the end of the disk. This backup table can be used to recover damage of the primary GPT near the beginning of the disk. There are a few caveats regarding GPT. Using GPT on a BIOS-based computer works, but the user won't be able to deal with it with Microsoft Windows operating system since Microsoft Windows refuses to boot from a GPT partition when in BIOS mode. Some buggy old motherboard firmware configured to boot in BIOS CSM legacy mode might also have problems when booting from GPT labeled disks. So this particular machine I've got hasn't got a compatibility mode. I can't tell it that uh, the operating system is booting in uh, BIOS mode. It has to be UEFI mode. So it basically means on this machine I've got to use GPT. I, I would thoroughly recommend if you've got a machine that's capable of booting UEFI to leave it in UEFI mode and install GPT unless you've got a particular reason that you want to use MBR. Um, the master boot record sector, uh, boot sector, also called DOS boot called DOS boot sector, DOS disk label, and more recently in contrast to GPT UEFI setups, legacy BIOS boot was first introduced in 1983 with the PC DOS 2.x, so 41 years ago now. Um, I believe that version of DOS was the first to um, support hard disks, if I if I can remember correctly, uh, which is why it was introduced at that time. MBR uses 32-bit identifiers for the start sector and length of partitions and supports three partition types, primary extended logical. Primary partitions have their information stored in the master boot record itself, a very small space, usually 512 bytes located at the beginning of the disk. Due to this small space, only four primary partitions are supported, for instance, SDA 1 to 4. Um, in order to support more partitions, one primary partition in the MBR can be marked as extended and this partition can then contain additional logical partitions, which is basically a partition within a partition. So important, still, although still supported by most mother motherboard manufacturers, MBR boot sectors and their associated partitioning limitations are considered legacy. Unless working with hardware that is pre-2010, it's best to partition a disk with a GUID partition table, i.e. GPT. Readers who must proceed with this setup type should knowingly acknowledge the following information. Most post-2010 motherboards consider using MBR boot sectors a legacy, a supported but not ideal boot mode. 
due to the 32-bit identifiers, partition tables in the MBR cannot address storage space that is larger than two terabytes in size. So that's uh, something that's worth thinking about if you've got a, for example, eight terabyte disk. Unless an extended partition is created, MBR supports a maximum of four partitions and this setup does not provide a backup boot sector. So if something overwrites the partition table, all the, inf all the partition information will be lost. That said, MBR and legacy BIOS may still be used in virtual cloud environments such as AWS. And the handbook also suggests using GPT whenever possible for Gen 2 installations. So as you can see in the, uh, the Windows installation that I've got in this machine, which is as it came from the factory, it has got five partitions. So you can see already it's got a GPT layout, which is confirmed here by this line here, this label type GPT. Um, so yeah, the handbook also suggests using GPT whenever possible. So that's what I'm going to be using because I need to, because I can only boot into UEFI basically, even if I, I did want to try something else, I can't. The official boot, Gen 2 boot media provides support for LVM. Um, this is probably something that's a bit more advanced. I won't be dealing with that, but it's supported there. Throughout the remainder of the handbook, we'll discuss and explain two cases. One is UFI firmware with GUID partition table, which is what we'll be dealing with on this video. And the MBR DOS legacy BIOS firmware with MBR partition table disk. Where while it's possible to mix and match move types, it's um, not recommended basically. Um, it's strongly recommended to use UFI boot with a GPT disk labeled disk. The following partitioning scheme will be used as a simple example layout. Um, it says important the first row of the following table contains exclusive information for either a GPT disk label or an MBR DOS legacy BIOS disk label. When in doubt, proceed with GPT since the AMD machines, AMD64 machines manufactured after the year 2010 generally support UFI firmware and the GPT boot sector. So this is the layout that they're suggesting. Basically the first partition, a gigabyte in size, and that's used for um, EFI system partition. And that has to be formatted to FAT32. Then followed by a swap partition, which they reckon to be RAM size times two. Well, I've got 128 gigabytes in this machine if i did that that would be 512 uh, sorry 256 gigabytes which would be half the space so that's not on really um i tend to create uh, swap partitions of somewhere around one or two gigabytes um i'll probably use two gigabytes in this case um but that used to be a common recommendation but i don't think it's really uh, warranted so much these days um, it's down to you to decide what size you want to use for uh, a swap partition uh, maybe read on the internet as to what current recommendations are but yeah I do think that's a bit excessive um, and then the remainder of disk will be the actual root partition uh, which is formatted to XFS uh, they used to recommend formatting to EXT4. I believe XFS um, handles data. Is it smaller files? Uh, I can't remember the reason why XFS has been recommended now, unless it, they might mention it later on. It might be something to do with the fact that it handles files better on solid state devices. Um, so, oh, is it this bit here, maybe? No, there's no information coming up when I hover. Oh, they are. No, it doesn't particularly mention the reason why they're using XFS there. So may maybe they'll mention it later on. Uh, if both the FDISC and part of the partitioning use utilities, including within the uh, official live environment, FDISC is well known, stable, and handles both MBR and GPT disks. Um, so it goes into a bit more detail about how big the partition should be 
Oh, there's some information here about the swap space. So recommendations, swap space size. Okay, it, it, their recommendations are based on whether you're going to use hibernation or not, whether you're going to use suspend or not. So as you can see, for two gigabyte, gigabytes or less, they recommend twice the amount of RAM if you're going to use suspend. For hibernation, three times the amount of RAM for two gigabyte, gigabytes or less, two to eight gig they recommend. The RAM amount or two times RAM for hibernation and so on. Um, 64 gig or greater, they recommend 8 gigabyte minimum, minimum for suspend and hibernation not recommended. So, in my case, uh, it looks like I'll create an 8 gigabyte swap partition um, and I have to remember that hibernation is not recommended. I'll base it because it's going to take a long time by the looks of it. Uh, as it says here, there's no perfect space, uh, value for the swap space. Um, basically, if you make it too big, you're going to be slowing the system down if you're running out of RAM because it's going to be writing to disk or not. And with electronic disks, obviously, you've got the issue of uh, right amplification and wearing out the uh, sectors on, on the disk um, so it's something to bear in mind Yeah, and it's also worth noting that swap files can be used as an alternative swap partitions. Um, the only caveat is that they, they may be slightly slower because you're going through another layer of abstraction, which is the file system layer. With a uh, swap partition, the swap access is direct to the partition. Uh, with a file, a swap file, the data read and written from the swap file has to go through the file system so that that's why the swap files may be a little bit slower <clears throat> than as compared to a swap partition um, what is the efi system partition when installing gen 2 on a system that uses ufi to boot it's essential that the efi system partition is created um, it's not required when booting in bios uh, legacy mode the esp must be a fat variant variant sometimes known as a VFAT. The official UFI denotes FAT12, 16 or 32. Um, FAT32 is recommended. If you're booting with the BIOS boot, it needs a one or two megabyte partition which is not formatted. It's used by Grub, I believe. Uh, yes. Um, to boot the BIOS mode and is not required in EFI or UFI mode. So partitioning the disk for GPT with UFI. The following parts explain how to create a simple partition layout for a single GPT disk device, which will conform to the UEFI specification and discoverable partition specifications. DPS is a specification provided as part of the Linux user uh, user space API group specification and is recommended by entirely optional. The specifications are implemented using the FTSC utility, which is part of the SysApps Util Linux package. The table provides the recommended defaults for a trivial Gen 2 installation. Additional partitions can be added according to personal preference or system design goals. So viewing the current partition layout, well, we've already seen it. Um, and it does say how to remove all the disk partitions. One thing I quickly will show you is you may want to erase the disk. Now with a traditional spinning disk, you can use DD to do this. Um, and you can do in file from dev uh, zero 
So it's a virtual device that just provides zeros and then out file equals slash dev and the uh, device name. So I'll just call it dev sdz because I don't want to actually write anything here in case I press enter by accident. Uh, do block size, for example, 64K is a good size or maybe even one meg and status equal progress. And that'll just write zeros to every sector. Absolutely not recommended for solid state devices because um, you'll end up wearing out the disk a little bit quicker than is absolutely necessary. Um, you can use HD Palm to erase a disk, a spinning disk or a, a SATA SSD. If you type in HD Palm security help, uh, yeah, security help, it shows you how to do this and what you basically do without actually performing the commands is you need to do set password so HD Palm security set you type in a password for example I always use password because that's what's in the help if I ever forget I'll, the password I'll use this one here so that it's always a reminder that's what I've used and then you type in the device name that locks the drive with that password so that the drive can't be accessed by anything else you can then use the um, security arrays command uh, you have to type in the password then the device and that will go ahead and use the um, internal uh, functions of the drive to erase this so the drive will actually erase itself you'll send a command to the drive telling it to do a security erase and it will use its own algorithms and functions to erase every sector it won't be any quicker on a spinning disk it won't be any quicker than writing zeros to the drive um, uh, but you can use this command on a SATA drive that a solid state SATA drive um, and you'll find it's a lot quicker and a lot safer than writing zeros to the drive. It will just, um, uh, you know, may take 10 seconds or 15 seconds, 20 seconds maybe to erase it on a, uh, a solid state SATA drive. Uh, if you're paranoid, you might want to do the erase uh, enhanced. Uh, again with the password and the device and on a spinning disk that may take a little bit longer maybe take five ten minutes longer than the standard arrays it can take the same amount of time as the standard arrays uh, on a solid state SATA drive it will take the same amount of time as a standard arrays if you are on, in particular, a Dell machine, um, and certainly some HP machines and possibly Lenovo machines, in my experience, you may find that you'll get an error back, a sense error. And what it is is the BIOS of those machines put the disk puts the disk into a state where you can't set the password uh, to. Um, I believe. The Discs get frozen um, and you need to unfreeze the disk. So what you can do here is to go to the menu here and sleep the machine. And this is where setting the passwords comes into useful. You know, remember I set the password uh, initially when I booted into this environment. Put the machine to sleep and then uh, bring the machine back out of the sleep. Type the password in that you set and then retry the command you should find that the command will then work correctly you won't get the sense errors um, on on definitely on dell machines it seems all dell machines do it and as i say i think hp machines can do it and probably lenovo machines uh, and it's a very good chance there may be other machines that, that um, put the disk into that that condition i think it's frozen it puts it into on uh PCIe Express NVMe machines there's a different command NVMe 
which has got commands that you need to send to it. Um, if you do NVMe list, it shows you what devices are attached to the machine. So you can see I've got NVMe uh, 0 and 1. And you can do the format command. Uh, let's do help. Yeah, you can do format help. And it gives you some information. And it's not a true format in the traditional sense where it checks every sector. It just uh, basically clears the drive in a similar way to the security functions of HDPalm. HDPalm works with ATA interfaces. Uh, NVMe works with NVMe interfaces. So that's why we've got a different command. And um, basically to format the drive or to erase it, you do NVMe format uh, minus S or SES. So minus S is a short form, SES is the long form, in which case you have to put two minus uh, two dashes in, which is a secure erase. And the different levels, um, I think one is probably the level you probably want to use, which is just the standard erase. Uh, the two erases the encryption key on the disk, so it's probably a little bit more secure. Uh, but generally, I find one is sufficient. So if I put one in, and bear in mind, what I'm going to do now is going to erase the disk. So if you've got any data on your disk and you run this command or any other commands I'll show you, um, that will be the end of the information on disk. You do want to make sure that you've backed up anything. But I'm going to... Um, actually, I need to put the device in, so slash dev slash nvme zero n one, and it says it's going to irrevocably delete the device's data. I've got ten seconds to press Control C to cancel the operation, so it's just enough time to read that and take it in, and it's formatted it. And now I should have a blank disk. So if I do F disk minus L, you can see that um, this disk has now got a blank uh, partition table. In fact, it's not even a partition table. Uh, yeah, one thing I have to mention is this error here comes up. It always confuses me, and it just confused me then until I remembered. It always refers to the device below the message. Because there's a space here, and this message is right next to this, I was thinking, crikey, how can that have a PMBR, a GPT PMBR mismatch when this hasn't got a, uh, a partition label associated with it? It's just been raised, and like I say, it's because it's associated with the device below. So basically that, that error or warning is to do with the flash device. And it may be because I've written a three gigabyte um, image to a 14 gigabyte image uh, flash device, or it may be because the image doesn't fit correctly or exactly onto that device. I don't know, but I'm not too concerned about it. The important thing is, is that this device here is has been erased. So I can now carry on with the commands that we've got in the book here. Um, obviously, I haven't got SDA. It's not what I'm going to be doing because SDA is my flash disk. I don't want to touch that one. I want to be dealing with NVMe. In fact, the best thing I always recommend is to double click the device in the printout there. And then there's no chance of any uh, mistakes being made. So you can see by default, it says it doesn't recognize a recognized partition label. Um, and it's by default created MBR, this label. It's not what I want. So if I do P to print out the current uh, settings on that disk, you can see there, there is no error message. There's nothing come up in red or warning me of anything. And you can see that in memory, it has created a DOS DOS this label with that identifier there. If you did want to go through the uh, format commands that I've shown you, then you can use the G command, which will erase the label anyway. It'll overwrite an existing GPT label 
and create a new one. Um, and it will also overwrite the DOS label that it creates by default. So now if I do P, you can see it's changed the this label type to from DOS to GPT. And it's given a new identifier as well. Uh, it does say alternative is to delete all the partitions one by one, but obviously you'll still retain the data on the disk. So if you do want to completely wipe the disk, the uh, commands I showed to delete them are probably the best ones to uh, get rid of all the data permanently. So they recommend a one gigabyte ESP partition. That's probably a bit over the top, but given that the kernels are getting bigger, you might want to later on add other Linuxes with their own kernels. Um, so one gigabyte is probably a good size looking forward to the future. So let's do N like they do to create a new partition. Create partition number one. And you see they take the first sector default by pressing enter and then they type in plus one gigabyte. Not going to worry about what sector number it is, just tell it I want a one gigabyte partition. And you can see it um, has created a new Linux file system partition of size one gigabyte. They've also got uh, a message saying that the partition one contains a VFAT signature. Do you want to remove it? That's because they didn't erase the data on this beforehand. All they've done is uh, they've either created a new um, disk label or they've deleted the partitions and used the existing disk gpt disk label so that's why that's that's happened because i formatted the disk there's nothing on there to give that warning so now we want to tell it it's not actually a linux file system we want to tell it it's the efi system partition so to do that as you can see they use the option t let's make this a bit bigger So you can see they're using the uh, option T to change the type of partition and you can do L to list all of them. They're changing it to type one. So you can see type one is the EFI system, which is the type of partition it is. And you can see that the uh, unique ID for that type of partition is that that number will never change because that number indicates the type of partition. So let's do Q there and type one and you can see it's changed it to EFI system if we now do P to print it you can see uh, there is there a one gigabyte partition and it's an EFI system type and it's partition one on the NVMe 0 N1 device and it says So that's to change the partition format, which it should have already used, actually. All right, it's just saying the other way is to is to type in the um, discoverable system partition number explicitly and that will also set it to um, the same number uh, let's go into expert mode and do p you can see the number that's already there is the correct number it starts c12a 7328 which is what they've typed in and it ends in ec93b as you can see there so there's two ways of doing it. You can do it the expert way by typing in that long number, which is probably going to be prone to errors. Or you can do it, I think, the probably more intelligent way is just to type in a partition number, a type, sorry, partition type of one, which refers to EFI system. And that in turn writes this signature. So let's press R to return. Now let's create the swap partition. Partition number two will take the default. If you remember, it recommended for my system, which was 64 gig or 
greater an 8 gigabyte minimum so I'm going to stick that 8 gigabyte minimum so instead of the plus 4 gig which they're using I'm going to use plus 8 gig value out of range oh that's interesting oh right okay sorry that's the first sector first sector I want the default now I want to select the size that's better so it's, if I now print it up, you can see it's created a Linux file system, which is eight gigabytes in size. So the number of sectors, it's effectively half that number because the sectors are only five, 12 bytes in size. Again, I want to change the type of that. So T and I want to change it to type 19, but it looks like it. So if I do L to list them, uh, sorry, partition number two, L to list them you can see type 19 is indeed a Linux swap and it should change the uh, signature that partition to that number there so I press Q type 19 and it says change for, uh, to Linux swap from the Linux file system again if I go into expert mode and do a print you can see that um, signature starts 0657 and once again, you can type that in manually, that number 0657, as you can see, it starts there and ends with 4F4F, which it does there. R to return. And finally, I need a partition to store basically the rest of the system. So that'll be all the files, all the programs we install. So once again, new partition number three, start with the default the first one and I'll take up all the rest of the partition uh, sorry all the rest of the, the disk uh, to create the partition and you can see the remainder is approximately 470 gigabytes don't need to change the type because the default type is Linux file system um, it says set the roots type to Linux root is not required and the system will function normally if it's set, set to the Linux file system type. This file system type is only necessary for cases where a bootloader that supports it, i.e. system deboot is used and the FS tab file is not wanted. So pedantically you can set it to system root, but it's not really necessary. Um, despite that, it shows us changing it to uh, Linux root so I guess it's probably advisable to change it change partition 3 list them all system root uh, x8664 so it should be yeah partition 23 type 23 so let's set that to 23 and print that up there And again, it can be set. So if we do the P, which we've done, and just check that it looks similar, um, this particular NVMe, I could say, hasn't got the larger sector sizes. Uh, they are just 512 bytes. Um, looks like they've got a actual hard disk here, judging by that. Uh, information there so it's uh, an advanced format hard disk physically the sectors are 4k but logically they're presented as um, half a byte a half a kilobyte um, so that may be important but for our purposes uh, it's just standard 512 so to save it we just do W to write that information and that's done then we skip this bit because it's to do with BIOS legacy boot so let's just scroll past all of that and now it's on to creating file systems when using SSD or NVMe drive it's wise to check for firmware upgrades some Intel SSDs in particular require firmware upgrades Grade for possible data corruption induced by XFS IO usage patterns. 
problems at firmware level, not any fault of the XFS smart file system. The smart control utility can help check the device model and firmware revision. Okay, so that's interesting. This is an Intel SSD. It's not a 600p as far as I know, or 6000p. Let's have a look at this. Okay, so it looks like this is where it's identified as being uh, lots of technical stuff. There being a, an Intel problem. Um, so maybe that's something I can do. Uh, so yeah, what I'll do is I'll do HD Palm just to check to see if this is that model or not, uh, or even NVMe might be better. List again. Uh, yeah, it doesn't look like it is that model. That ties up with that there, so I'm not going to be concerned about that. So I'm just going to go straight on to formatting the partitions. So the partitions we need to format, the root needs to be formatted as XFS. Um, it doesn't say why, oh XFS here. Okay, XFS notably supports ref links and copy on writes, which is particularly helpful on Gen 2 systems because the amount of compiles users complete. So that's what it is. It's the fact, the fact that it's got a copy on write and ref links. Yeah, that's why they've moved from ext4 to XFS. Um, the only thing is, it says that. Um, the only downside is that XFS partitions cannot yet be shrunk. So that's the only downside if you need to reduce the file system. It's a bit unfortunate. So um, what we need to do is to format the third partition. So let's do FDisk minus L. And our third partition is this one here, so we need to do mkfs.xfs with the partition name, and that should format the root partition. The EFS, uh, sorry, EFI system partition needs to be formatted with a 32-bit FAT partition. So let's copy that and then paste in the first partition identification. Yep, that's done. And then legacy BIOS boot, we don't need to touch. Then we need to format, if you like, the swap partition, not actually formatting it, it just writes a little header to it. So we do that to the second partition and they, they should all be formatted now. And we can turn on the swap partition in case we need it, highly unlikely. Uh, yeah, okay, so see what I've done there. I've copied and pasted and luckily it's not a right command, but it's obviously the wrong identification uh, this is the identification that I need to use. So we now should have uh, swap activated. 
and there it is there. Now we need to mount the root partition, so we create a location where we can mount it. And we create an EFI directory as well where we can mount the EFI partition. Now we mount our third partition, which is our root partition at the Oh, that's interesting that's been created this should be created after the device has been created actually yeah let's do that first I don't quite understand that what we've done is we've created a directory uh, called gen 2 on on mount Once created, it's time to make partitions accessible via the mount. Yeah, then they mount the root partition at Gen 2, but that would mask this partition. So to me, that looks like that's been done in the wrong order. So I'm going to remove this directory. Then I'm going to mount our data partition, our root partition, at... MNT Gen 2. So that should be empty. Which it is. Now I'm going to run this command to create the EFI directory so that we can mount our EFI partition, I presume, at some point. If temp needs to reside on a separate partition, be sure to change its permissions after mounting. Okay, it doesn't as far as I know. 